Sunday after Pentecost is from the book of Matthew, 21st chapter, verses 43 and 44. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And when he falls on anyone, it will crush him. How many of you remember the 2016 LWML convention that took place in Lubbock, Texas? Or even remember the, uh, the guest speaker that came to speak at that time? Her name is Cindy Steinbach. She was a, uh, she was the author of the book, The Vine Speaks, and she uh, did uh, invite a lot of her friends to come and demonstrate how the work of God in the vineyard and how uh, we as people of God are to be fruitful and continue to uh, make good wine for his kingdom. She extended an invitation to our Muslim friends, Muslim neighbors who came that day because they couldn't go inside and hear her speak because they couldn't vote. So we had a lot of women outside. So later she noticed these women dressed up in different clothes and she asked me, why aren't they inside? I said, well, because they're not, uh, they can't vote. So she decided to speak to them at the end and they were so thankful that she uh, communicated the grace of God through this blessed vineyard that her family has been uh, working at for 155 years. I mean, good Lutheran wine that she has been produced. And uh, the, the summary of the labor, I can only express it in this way. It was all squeezed in such a little bottle like this. This is the Stein back family. Cindy and her family have been, by the way, this is our Pastor Jared uh, gift at the end for his, uh, for a uh, Sunday Pastor Appreciation Day. So this is what he watched. Probably one. Probably one. <laughs> so the Steinbeck family was, uh, vineyard was healthy with graceful grapes that have even produced wine for this long. And I can only remember one thing when my wife and I went there to uh, watch their work. And, I mean, it's, it was a huge, huge vineyard. And she took us to this mountain and said, she said, you know, a good vineyard is usually like we read in the text on, on the hill of a mountain. And she said, uh, Working hard and making good wine is our passion, but Jesus is our life. She added, we work hard for Jesus in order to produce good wine. And that's true, also in the kingdom of Christ. Today, Mission Sunday, is also a time to celebrate the work of the church and the fruit of its labor within its community and around the world. As partners in the gospel to all peoples, disciples of the way, ministry, and Christ the King, Lutheran Church, Waxahachie, share the love of Christ with our neighbors, remembering Jesus, his love for us, his means of grace in the gift of baptism and communion. The word community and the word union together make the word come union. In our gospel reading, Jesus' parable speaks about the vineyard's owner 
and the vineyard's tenants being engaged in a violent conflict. And that is bad for grapes. And graceful tenants produce sour grapes and, and fruitful vineyards. Sour grapes produce bad wine, and that's bad for communion. We certainly do not want to drink from the cup of wrath the people of Israel had to drink from in Isaiah chapter 5 that we just read. When Jesus started to describe the wicked's tenants and truthfulness and truthfulness, his audience will have quickly noted he was using Isaiah 5. So let's hear again what the vineyard's owner, God, says and does to the wicked Israel in Isaiah's text in order to get to the heart of Jesus' parable before us this morning. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. Notice, the owner of the vineyard, God, does the same work in Jesus' parable. He is not asking Israel or the wicked tenants for repentance at this point. The theme seems to be the call to repentance, but that never actually appears in the text. Rather, there is only the contrast between what the farmer, God, had done, and now what the farmer, God, will do. However, Jesus' parable about the wicked tenants is taking things a step further. The vineyards isn't just yielding wild grapes. The tenants are beating the help and killing of the air. The owner's son, what is God to do? Both Isaiah and Jesus ask, how should the vineyard's owner handle this? My question for you this morning, what will you do about the wicked acts of violence and injustice taking place in our streets, in our lands, as we speak today? The violence in this passage is not being initiated by an angry and vengeful God. The result from human injustice. Jesus asked, what will the owner do to those tenants? Verse 41, then the listeners said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants will give him the produce at the harvest time. These acts of injustice contain within themselves the seeds of their own destruction. Sour grapes produce sour wine. But God's Spirit works and moves the people who want to produce grateful vine that will produce fruitful vineyards. If we are not fruitful in the kingdom of Christ and making disciples from all nations globally, God will take it away from us and find people who want to hear and proclaim what they hear to the world. Jesus, the true vine, speaks this morning. 
says to every one of us here, I am the vine and you are the branches. Abide in me and you will bear much fruit. The world is God's vineyard. The planet itself and all life upon it, the means of production and work, the activity of the church and its means of grace, of word and sacrament, and the lives we are leading to Christ are all canvassed by God's grateful and fruitful vineyard of the gospel. We must plant for the long haul. We must care about all the tender vines and grapes and to nourish and enjoy this vineyard. Their work include our spiritual lives, our worship as brothers and sisters in Christ, and prayers, building a relationship, reaching out with the gospel of Jesus Christ to all people, and serving our community, spreading forgiveness and hope all around the world. I've been studying this text and then I realized that there are three types of vineyards. Number one, vineyard or church. They tell the neighbors, we will pray for you. We will add you to our prayer list. And then number two, vineyard or church. Go the extra mile. And they reach out to their neighbors in their communities by serving them and inviting them to come hear the word of God and eat and drink Jesus' body and blood for the forgiveness of their sin. That's not so bad. The number three, which is my favorite, is a grateful vineyard. This grateful vineyard makes disciple makers in order to grow the kingdom of Christ, not by addition, but by, by multiplications. This I like to call the apostolic vineyard of Christ. Listen to John chapter 15, verse 7 and 8, how beautifully Jesus says it. If you abide in me, in my words, abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Disciple makers are good proof to show that they are working in the very The ministry of disciples of the way has planted the vines of a new life giving and gospel producing ministries in the DFW Metroplex. The mark of a gospel producing vineyard is the production of new, healthy grapes for new wine and not just drinking everything down in the cellar ourselves. In the last 17 years, we have been working very hard to tend this vineyard's gospel to our Muslim friends who are in our midst this morning. These vineyards, fruits of the gospel, are now bearing much fruit. And our challenge ahead, mine, yours, and our churches together, is to continue to make disciple makers according to Matthew 29, 28, 19, 28. And the question will keep asking is this how is God calling you personally in your church to abide in the vine here are some statistics I hope that will help you realize the harvest in a uh, in a world that is just multiplying every day around us did you know that there are 1,537,000,000 1, Muslims in the world today? 
they make up 22% of the world's second largest religion. Second to Christianity, 28%. Did you know that 4.19 million full-time Christian workers, which is about 95%, are working within the Christian world? What I mean is, the majority of our churches, Christian churches in the world, are administering to already Christian communities and places in the world. In other words, there is only one Christian missionary for every 400,000 plus Muslims in the world today. Yes, you are looking at the one who is helping to do ministry to Muslim people in our Texas district. According to the 2017 census data, Pew Research Center, 621 Arab Muslims live in the United States today, and 35,000 in one very concentrated area in Dallas. It's called Vickery Meadows. It's right off 75 and Park Lane on the other side of the highway. The bad news is that there are 500 churches within 15 mile radius from this concentrated area. 500 churches within 15 mile radius from this Mecca here in our town, in our state, in our city. But they are not serious about reaching out to their Muslim neighbors. They want somebody else to do that job. The good news, the good news is that God has placed out the ministry of disciples of the way right in the heart of his harvest, his right venue, because our missionaries, and one of them is here this morning, are serious about making its fruit. As Jesus said, in verse 543, therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruit. We are serious about the gospel of Jesus Christ because we know at one point in our life, at one time, we didn't know anything about his grace. But it was because of God's grace that we are in his grace. But we can't keep this gospel for ourselves. It is for us to share with people who do not know him in our communities and around the world. The problem in Isaiah 5 or Matthew 21 or even now do not lie with God but with us. The Israelites should have responded to God's grace and mercy with praise and lives of love to other people. The good grapes God expected will be mercy and love, generosity in stewardship of time and talents. Instead, God saw the sour grapes of selfishness, greed, corruption, wickedness. But I guess what happened in the end? They got their reward in full. Like I said in these texts of Isaiah, God wasn't expecting repentance this time. He let the guillotine fall down. And when God does that, He does it well. The land was despoiled, the temple destroyed, the mighty were brought low. What God spoke through the prophet Isaiah, God did. Throughout all the scriptures, there is nothing as plain as God's friendship with the lost, the lowly among us. It is the meek who will inherit the earth, those who mourn who shall be comforted, the poor in the spirit who will gain the kingdom of heaven. Nothing could show God's love better than the gift of Jesus, the righteousness of Christ that has been given to us freely. His coming is the triumph over sin and evil, death and the devil.
for us and for all who so ever believe in him. Let me close with these few words. Judge between God and people. It was the question Isaiah asked for his hearers during the Harvest Festival in the 8th century BC. It is our question today. God has done so much for us. Yes, even in our darkest times, when we feel abandoned or alone, we have God's promise that God is with us. God has done such great things for us. Now, yes, now, we just pray that we will bear good fruits in our lives and build grateful vineyards and gospel-filled churches in our communities. God will continue to plant and cultivate his beloved finger, his church. Grapes will grow again and wine will flow again. So bless us, O Lord. Let your vineyards be grateful and fruitful. Amen. Amen. So may the peace of God be